Hi, I'm Robert Lundberg, the CTO and co-founder of Perceptor Labs, and this is an introduction to deep learning. Before I start talking about deep learning, I'm going to quickly touch on what machine learning is. There are a lot of different machine learning methods, but the one I want to focus on to start with is called clustering. Clustering involves grouping data together to find patterns or trends. Before we can start doing clustering though, we need some kind of data. So let's imagine we have a registry of people as medical records, where each person has a few different features. For example, an age, a blood type, a gender, a height, etc, etc. To visualize this data, we can imagine a space with data points in them, as similar to a night sky with stars. Here, the data points are placed differently depending on the values of their features. So someone old may be placed over to the right, someone young to the left, someone tall at the bottom, and someone short at the top. What clustering does is find groups of these people depending on how close their data points are. And in that way, we can find people who are similar to each other from a data perspective. So in the case of a medical record, one group may correspond to people in a danger zone, while another to people with a certain illness. And although this example was with people, we can of course apply it to other things as well, such as images or music, to find similarities there. There are a few key takeaways from this. First is that clustering is done almost automatically, with minimum human interference. Hence why it's called machine learning. The most a person has to do in this example is to set how many clusters they want, and sometimes not even that is needed. Instead, the clustering looks at the dataset and creates its clusters. You can say that it learns the data or trains on that data. The second part is what this clustering method now has done for us. We now have a much more structured dataset where it's a lot easier for a human to understand what's going on inside it. The other big benefit we get is that we now know how different groups look like. So if we get a new person entered in our registry, we can really quickly check which group they belong to, and from that know what type of person they are. This highlights the two main points of machine learning. To be able to structure data, and to be able to feed something into it to get something back. For example, feed a person's details into it to get a prediction of their health status back. There are plenty of other machine learning methods, too many to go through here, but the other one I wanted to focus on involves something called a neuron. A neuron is something which we have in our brain, which is where the name comes from, but it's also a very simple function, commonly used in machine learning. And I say it's very simple, because it really just takes a bunch of inputs and sums them together. However, if we add a little twist to it, and multiply each input with a variable which we can adjust, often this variable is called weights or w, we'll find that we have something really powerful. This is because we now can customize what output we want to see. Say for example we only want x1 as output, we can then put w1 as 1 and the rest to 0. Or if we want a mix, we can put them all to a value such as 0.3. As I mentioned before, one of the main points of machine learning is to be able to put something in and then get something out, which we now can do very customized. And this is just with one neuron. We can also stack them on top of each other to create multiple outputs. Or we can put multiple layers of these neurons after each other to create a network of neurons, or a neural network. And if there are enough layers so it gets deep enough, it's then called a deep neural network. By doing this, you can have millions of these weights, which will be able to accurately learn exactly what answer you want from the inputs. And afterwards, it will be very good at being able to tell you answers from new outputs it's never seen as well. It's important to note that these weights don't have to be set by hand, but instead they're learned by training on data, very similarly to how the clustering did it. This is done by an algorithm called backpropagation.
for the most part. The only thing a human behind it needs to care about is how many neurons they want and in which formation or architecture. The practice of building, training and using such deep neural networks, or DNNs for short, is called deep learning. Because of how complex DNNs are, it has very quickly outperformed more traditional machine learning methods and is often used for things such as image classification, anomaly detection, predictive maintenance, generating new data, automatic control, and many others. However, two challenges in deep learning are that 1. Because it's so complex, it often requires a very large amount of data to train on, and 2. It can be difficult for machine learning developers to visualize what's going on inside of the model. Now, let me show you how a simple neural network could look like. To start with, we'll need some data. In this case, we have a dataset called MNIST, which is a very standard dataset consisting of handwritten digits. We have two data sources, one for the sample images and one for the labels, or the ground truths. It is also common to allocate a percentage of your data into training, validation and test. The training part is used to train the model, while the validation part is used to constantly test the model during the training. The test part is then used to test the model after training is done. All of this is done to make sure you get a model which can generalize well and does not over-optimize against the data. You might need to process your data. For example, in this case, we're reshaping it into an image. The labels can be processed as well, and in this case we're changing them from an integer into an array where there's a 1 at the integer's position. This is done so that the dimension of the labels will be the same as the dimension of the output of the model. Then we have the layers I was talking about earlier. In this case we have two layers of neurons. Training can be done by comparing the output of the model to the labels and then using a algorithm, in this case called the ADAM optimizer, to constantly update the weights of the neurons. When the network architecture is set, we can start training. Depending on the size of your dataset and the size of the model, training may take minutes, hours, or even days. Training results in a finished model, which can be used for prediction and inference. A machine learning developer may repeat this process of viewing the results, changing the network architecture, and rerunning the entire training process multiple times. In this video, we've seen how data can be structured in different ways to make sense of it, and how deep learning approaches, like neural networks, provide a powerful tool for allowing machines to learn from that data. Thank you for watching this video. And make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and stay tuned for more fun tutorials and use cases that we will be continuously publishing. And if you have any questions, suggestions, issues, or just want to get in touch, please visit our forum at forum.perceptlabs.com or reach out to me directly at our Slack channel. Thank you!